Welcome to day two. Thank you for joining everyone. Today, um, we will be talking on the lens aspects and other topics. Uh, yesterday, we talked about the uh, camera components, what makes a camera. There are many components that make a camera. Some of the key components that is relevant to us as engineers of project design, project implementation, are what are the types of cameras, metal, plastic. We talked about the vandal resistant for the camera. We talked about the different type of lenses for the camera. Then the CPU or, or the SOC, system on chip. It's not just CPU, it's with other components that makes the system on chip. System on chip is responsible for three major uh, expectations from the camera. One of them is image processing. You may recollect that we saw WDR yesterday, we saw IR, low light, thermal camera, P iris, DC iris. We saw all of these uh, image related techniques yesterday. Who's doing that? The chipset is actually processing all this information. If there is too much sunlight, that WDR has to kick in. If there is a very little light, low light features have to kick in. Similarly, P iris and other uh, image aspects or uh, image settings will kick in in real time to make sure usable image is produced, right? As soon as the camera is looking at a specific area, uh, maybe dark, maybe bright, it has to produce useful image, something that you can make sense of in real time. So that is the job of the camera and the chipset. Next is how good it can compress the image. We will see all of this uh, in the coming days and slides. Then analytics, we will also be looking at it. Okay, now in the camera, we talked about IK10 rating. What is IK10? Vandal resistance or impact resistant. Someone trying to damage the camera with the physical force, physical impact, and the camera can withstand it, that is called vandal resistance. There is also environmental uh, protection of a camera. We, you, Most of you already know this part, IP66 rating, IP67 rating, IP65 rating. You might have come across this. Um, ingress protection, IP rating. Uh, let's just open a small reference and we'll just quickly go through it so we don't uh, miss this point. Go. Just. IP rating. Any camera which you use outdoor should be protected against dust, dust tight. IP66, okay, so this is how it is uh, written. IP66 or IP65. The first digit represents solid protection, which is the dust related. Second digit is for water. Nowadays, also your mobile phones are waterproof because they have this extra rubber seal, which protect water from getting inside, right? So this is water protection. You can have IP60. 6 and 0, which means it is fully protected against dust, but not against water. That can also be a case. So uh, do not look for just one number. Make sure both the numbers are there. The safest number for outdoor is IP66 in the Middle East because you have, uh, you also have rain, you also have fine dust uh, from the uh, you know sand. So you need both and uh, the best for outdoor rating is IP66. What about indoor? Not required because um, you have TV at home, you have everything at home. You don't put waterproof protection or anything, right? So you don't really need, unless it is in the kitchen, unless it is in area where there there is water, uh, there is a chance for water leak and all that. And maybe in a mechanical rooms and uh, certain utility rooms, you can have some IP rating for water, uh, but otherwise, for indoor applications, you don't really require any IP rating. OK. 
Okay, and uh, let's go forward. We talked about WDR. Highlight compensation. We talked about low light. We talked about, again, illumination. Zoom IR. This is the concept where the IR beam zooms in with respect to the zoom of the camera, especially for PTZ. There is a lens and there is an IR LED. Okay, then IR corrected lens. Uh, this is not very critical uh, for today's course, but for your information, uh, there are two types of light important in CCTV. One is the visible light and then the IR light. If you are into perimeter monitoring, if you're into uh, you know, outdoor monitoring in your projects, you have to know that visible light has a specific focal length. I mean, it focuses at a specific point. IR beam, this red light on the top, IR beam will have a different focal point. All right, so that means you have to uh, refocus the camera. I'm sorry. visible and IR. Okay, now the same camera at night time, it's blurred out because the focus of IR beam is on a different point. So it has to be readjusted. However, if you use IR corrected lenses, even in night time, it makes sure that IR beam is also focused at the same point. Okay, very few uh, cameras or series vendors will have these uh, small things implemented into their, you know, lenses, especially for, you know, uh, critical cameras, PTC cameras and other outdoor cameras. So just make sure if you have uh, a requirement where nighttime monitoring is critical. Okay, again, I emphasize this because whenever you do test or, uh, a user acceptance test or a proof of concept or when someone comes and displays their product in your showroom in your office in your property you verify it in the morning time morning time everything can look beautiful and uh, by evening time we all go home but if evening time monitoring is also critical you should do a POC even at the night time and make sure you're getting crisp images even at night time Okay, and uh, that's something you can keep note of. All right. Every camera, there is a focal length. We talked about it yesterday. Uh, lens ranging from 2.8 to 12. This is the most common lens, 2.8 to 12. Why is it most common? If I go ahead and uh, take one camera. So let's say this camera has got around uh, up to 10 mm. If I uh, want to zoom in, it's looking at the door, right? So let's say I'm going to zoom in. So I zoom out, make sure I'm all the way at the back. Okay, so the camera can see almost the entire room. If I zoom in, Okay. 
Now this is a maximum. This is your typical common lens, 3 to 10, 2.8 to 12. This is the typical range of how much it can zoom in and zoom out. Okay, I'm zooming all the way back. All right. Now what does this tell you? If you zoom in, this camera cannot cover who's sitting at the meeting table. It cannot cover the meeting room. It can only look at the door if I zoom in. Right. So right now, let's say I'm at 10 mm, 2.8 to 12 or 2.8 to 10. Right now I'm at 10 mm. So whenever a camera is installed in a property, uh, the idea is to uh, keep the cost in mind, right? So you will use the camera to cover as much area as possible. You will not start after the meeting room, right? Uh, let's say you're, mo you're monitoring a corridor, you will not start after 10 meters. So this is like 10 meter distance. So you will try to cover as wide as possible. Whatever the camera can see, uh, because you're already investing in the camera, you will try to monitor as wide as possible, as much area as possible, all right? So very uh, few locations you will be asked to focus in, maybe due to privacy here, you don't want to monitor who's sitting and discussing, or maybe you are only interested in the door, then you will zoom in. Otherwise, most of your projects, you will keep it zoomed out. So right now, zoom in. Previously, I was zoomed out. Okay. Now, when I said privacy, door, all this is not a day-to-day -day requirement. Very, very, I mean, in your public property, of course, you want to monitor all the areas, right? Waiting area, lift, lobby, storerooms, and everything. Only certain locations, entrances, you are interested in the door because you want to know who's coming in through the door with the full detail, like a clear, more uh, resolution you require for this area. Only for those locations, you will actually zoom in. Otherwise, you will keep it as wide as possible. All right. So this is very focal lens, uh, standard very focal lens. Why it is usually 2.8 to 10 or 3 to 10 or 2.8 to 12? This is the reason. Because not, not, uh, you can take a thumb rule. Every mm is like one meter blind spot. So if you start at 10 mm, you are losing 10 meter coverage. No one will buy a camera and put in the corridor and start after 10 meters because that's a waste of money. All right, so very uh, uh, most, I would say 95% of your typical project locations, you will, you will keep the camera at a wide angle at 2.8 or 3. You'll leave it at that location itself. All right, okay. Of course, you need projects where you need longer lens. Maybe the distance from the camera to the door is very far. Maybe the hotel, uh, the uh, nearest place to mount a camera is like 20 meters. The, the ceiling height is very high. You cannot put the camera. In that case, you will, uh, okay, let me explain this point. Okay, if you put the camera exactly on the top, let's say in your project you have a ceiling height of seven meters or 10 meters. If you put your camera on the top, you will only see the head of the person. You cannot get the face detail clearly. That's why we try to keep it, uh, we try to keep the camera as, uh, as low as possible to get the face details clearly. So if I am walking through the door, you can see my face clearly. If I keep it on the top, you will only see my head. Okay, then. And uh, yeah, all right. Focal length. So what is the takeaway? The more you zoom in, the more the coverage becomes narrow. So if my camera is here and if I zoom out, I'm looking at a wide angle. But if I zoom in, my, oh, I was, my drawing is poor. Okay, if I zoom in, the angle is narrow. Here, let me open the PowerPoint. Okay. 
camera, as I zoom in, as the focal length increases, the angle of coverage becomes narrower. Okay. Okay. Now, if your angle is very narrow, that means you need a lot of camera to cover a wide area. You can only see maybe one meter. If your uh, room is 10 meters, you need 10 cameras if you use a very narrow angle. So, however, if you use a wide angle, you need only one camera. Okay. Now, there is, uh, there is some conditions which we will see, like identification, detection, and so on. And that will determine what lens is required for a project. Okay, now uh, PTZ cameras. PTZ cameras are using zoom lens and they have very large focal lengths, 4.75 to 261, 6 to 222. Yesterday we saw, right, a PTZ camera zooming in all the way to the end of the uh, highway near the port. So I zoomed in and I showed you the PTZ camera. How does it work? Um, why is it called 55x zoom? Okay, so if uh, a PTZ camera is called a 55x zoom, that means from 4.75, from this mm focal length, you can go 55 times. So 4.75 into 55 times is 261, 261. So this is why it's called 55x, right? So 55 times it can zoom. It's optical zoom. It's not digital, it's optical zoom because the lens is zooming in. Okay. Okay. All right, so I have a question. Uh, this uh, camera, he asked me, why can't we put this camera above the ceiling near the door to focus at the door? Yeah, that is possible, no issue. Uh, I, this is my training room. I have put it intentionally to demonstrate a few things. Uh, so that's why there, there are cameras here as well to look at the, you can keep the camera because the ceiling height is not very high. So you can keep the camera even at the ceiling here and look at the person, all right? Can be done, no issue. However, there are locations where the ceiling height is very, uh, very. Uh, if it is very high, then you let's say six meters, 10 meters ceiling, double ceiling, triple ceiling height, especially at hotel main entrance lobbies, let's say you go to uh, Atlantis, you go to uh, Jewel of the Creek, certain projects when you enter, there is no ceiling. You have to walk at least 10 meters, 20 meters to go to the reception desk. And then you will have uh, just poles around, column poles. So you will see cameras mounted there and with a very big lens zoomed in to the uh, door. Okay, so the purpose is to get the face details clearly. All right. Now back to okay. Okay, uh, can I explain 50x one more time? Okay, focal length uh, is smaller. Focal length means wide angle. Large focal length means narrow angle. You can zoom further. How do you get the optical ratio? 30x, how do you get the optical ratio? You divide 261 maximum focal length divided by the minimum focal length. Oops, uh, yeah, 261 divided by 4.75 will give me 54.94. So it is rounded up and it is mentioned here as 55x zoom. What about 222? divided by six, 37x zoom, okay? Now, uh, the, even for uh, standard cameras, it can be mentioned, for example, 4.3x. It's not a PTZ camera, it just means 12 divided by 
2.8 is 4.28, 4.3 time zoom, motorized, very focal. Okay. Now, uh, for a PTZ camera, PTZ camera, this one, pan tilt zoom camera, it can rotate left, it can go up and down, and it can zoom, pan tilt zoom. Uh, higher the focal length, very good. As well as lower the focal length, very good. If you have uh, 10 mm, let's say the camera starts at 10 mm, that means you have a very narrow angle. Starting angle itself is very narrow. So your PTZ will have uh, will not be able to monitor very large area. So you want your camera to monitor as large as wide area as possible, as well as as narrow as possible. Okay. If your objective is only narrow, then it's okay. But if you want to do general monitoring, what's happening in the entire street, for example, uh, let me pull out that camera once again. So if my PTZ camera had a very narrow angle, I will not be able to get this wide view. Probably it will start, uh, you know, like, let's say it will have a little bit narrower. If it is, it might have a narrow view like this. So you cannot get a very big angle. So you should have both for a PTZ camera. Uh, next is what is a digital zoom after you zoom in all the way then you can do digital zoom just like you take a photo in your mobile phone and then you explode the image that is called digital zoom so uh, it's called blowing up your image so uh, just a second So let's say I have taken, this is, right now I'm looking at a person. Now if I zoom in, this is called digital zoom. I'm blowing up the image and the image gets, uh, you can say slightly pixelated. So this is digital zoom. Optical zoom, the uh, image quality does not reduce because it is optically zooming and you're still getting the full resolution at that entire scene. So even after I zoom in, for example, even after I have zoomed in, I'm still getting two megapixel video from this scene, all right? So this is called optical zoom. Okay. All right, if you have any further questions, you can post it on the chat window. Now, uh, another point, a camera, you can, look at that entire scene right my camera can look at the entire port my camera can look at uh, even the sun if i if i try to look at the sun i can look at the sun if i try to look at in the night time at the moon i can look at the moon uh, but does it mean i can see uh, millions of kilometers probably yeah it can see that but you cannot make any difference the moon looks the same there are so many things happening in the sun and the moon but you will not be able to notice you will not be able to detect any change so there is a criteria in cctv it's uh, something that we take it as minimum in our region it's called detection criteria 
what is the minimum amount of uh, resolution quality required uh, to achieve or to make uh, sorry to achieve detection basically to detect any change in the scene if there is someone moving in the scene if there is a car in the scene if there is some activity in the scene in order to detect with your human eye you need to have a certain level of pixels uh, available in the scene so that is called detection if your camera cannot do detection then there is no point in camera it's just a, a decorative piece right because for security it is not achieving any function you cannot do any detection you're just monitoring just like you're watching youtube it's gonna just show you everything all right so however um, it does not stop at detection you also have other parameters recognition identification uh, detection does not tell you who the person is it only tells you there is some level of activity there is some car moving there is a person there that's it all right but there is two more levels which is important for any cctv camera is uh, recognition and identification now this uh, let's say how do you explain this is a simple way just let me pull out the just a second okay this is a close-up photo and you are you have identified me right this is how i look now if you see me somewhere in a lobby somewhere in the hotel or somewhere in your place let's say you we catch up in our, some supermarket somewhere you will recognize me you will recognize me because you have looked at this photo you know this is samuel you have already registered this identified that if someone who looks like this wearing a glass and a hair and all that this physique this particular person is samuel so you have already identified him with a very close up photo with the facial feature and if you look at him somewhere else maybe walking around uh, some 20 30 meters somewhere distance from you you will still recognize and say hey i know this guy this is samuel it's like your um, just like you recognize a friend although he's walking at a very far distance right so you recognize him you're able to recognize because you have already identified him you know how he looks all right so that is the meaning of identification and recognition so in order to do recognition you have to first identify in order to do recognition you have to first identify then only you can recognize who it is identify means samuel this is muhammad this is ahmed this is kumar this is whoever so once you know this person has a name then you whenever you find a photo whenever you find this guy walking in that uh, cctv scene you know this is the same guy this is called recognition all right then strong identification we will see later on uh, so not every area requires identification not every area require recognition but everything requires at least detection okay so all this comes from a specific standard en standard not something uh, best practice it's a standard by default how many pixels are required to make sure you get enough details from the scene okay now Okay, pixel per meter, PPM. How do you make sure your camera has achieved a detection? Your camera should get at least 20 pixels per meter. How do you make sure the camera has reached recognition? 125 pixel. Similarly, identification is 250. Now, uh, This is a reference from a third party website to explain if you take a picture at 500 pixels, the face of the person is very clear. 
the number plate details are very clear if you take the same image 400 pixels again the face is clear enough details are clear enough 300 still you can identify and say all right this is this is person so and so and number plate is clear enough as you go down 200 pixel you start to see the details deteriorate he might have a brother who looks the same or there can be some of his same relatives who might look the same so this is not a sure short picture you cannot say for sure this is person a it is not possible with this image quality all right unless and until you have a reference right now you are sure this is the same guy because you have a reference here and then you try to compare it with this picture so this is called recognition again recognition uh, detection do you see detection 50 pixels you know there is a person you know there is a car but you cannot really uh, when you digitally zoom you can't really get the details okay okay now let's see Okay, now uh, you can, okay, now there is a, a common mistake amongst uh, typically, you know, maybe consultants or uh, even integrators, designers, there is a common mistake is, all right, so why don't I just to specify 300 pixels for my entire project? Uh, if you do that, then you will end up giving at least 30, 20 cameras for covering the entire parking lot. Okay, 10 to 20 cameras you will need to cover the entire parking lot because your expectation is 300 pixel per meter. So you cannot say I need identification in my ent entire project. So that's why you have to have a good balance. Uh, where you need detection, which area you can use identification and recognition has been, uh, you should be clear. Okay, very simple thumb rule. Whenever you're going to uh, look at a person for the first time in your property, you need identification. What is this first time? Reception, main entrances, parking entrances. This is where you look at a person for the first time, right? Then, of course, those locations, make sure you get identification what about recognition everything else simple right main entrance all identification everything else recognition however exception to recognition is very large areas large gardens large uh, parking areas uh, public surveillance you know those kind of locations you need to let go of recognition a bit, you can use a PTZ camera to do general uh, detection. If something happens, you can zoom in and find out what's going on. Okay, so this is what you can look at uh, as a detection parameter. Okay. Now, there are tools available. Uh, every vendor has their own tool, then there are also online free tools available to do this uh, calculation. So I will explain, first I will explain the free tool. You can use jvsg.com. So on this website, there is a free version called a Lens Calculator. You can take this. Okay, now if you're doing a design, you can take a, you don't have to choose any manufacturer. However, if you are very specifically working on one vendor, you can 
choose a particular brand you can choose a particular model otherwise go with one by three inch or one by 2.8 these are common lenses and a standard uh, uh, sorry sensors and the standard lens is 3 mm to 10 mm 3 2.8 to 12 mm so we can start with 3 mm and leave it at 2 megapixel let's say the person is standing at 15 meters right now he's stand, standing at 15 meters from the camera the view on the right side 74 pixel it is lower than recognition right what do you require for recognition 125 pixels at least so right now it's not very clear so in this case if you zoom in if i zoom in the image starts to become clearer and clearer 125 right so this is a recognition if you go closer the red zone that's when you reach identification okay now what's the blind spot from the camera till here you have zoomed in by 13 mm so once you zoom in by 13 mm almost 10 to 11 meters you cannot see anything uh, and then you can see the person very clearly so whenever you have main entrances you cannot uh, say I the, uh, there is a blind spot so it's okay I can sacrifice I want to see everything no it cannot be done entrances main entrances your primary priority is to get identification because otherwise you risk security so you have to get this if you still need to monitor this area you can have another camera to do that all right so if let's say this uh, this is not a main entrance right now let's say i'm not looking at a main entrance this is just a corridor standard corridor the person has already entered waiting area lobby area corridor area so you have already identified him right at the entrance now you just need to recognize where this guy is going so in that case you can go ahead and use a wide angle as much as you can get recognition so you can use a camera this way and uh, this particular camera can give you up to 15 meters recognition for an installation height of three you can make it three meter and focal length is five so that's why you generally take three to ten mm 2.8 to 12 mm most of your projects will be within this range except the main entrances where you may need extra lens right so uh, this is uh, this is what uh, how do you convert this into your field of view drawing let's say you have an autocad when you have an autocad first to draw a camera picture like icon uh, draw a straight line of uh, here here it's 15 meters right let's uh, look at the top view top view 15 meters so you can draw a line 15 meters and draw a vertical line after 15 meters after that there is a horizontal angle 55 degrees this angle the horizontal angle is 55 degrees so you would take fifty five by two that is twenty sorry twenty six twenty seven so you will take twenty seven point five degree and here you will take twenty seven point five degree and draw the line angle and then cut it at the fifteen meter so this is your cone this is your viewing cone so any camera with a sensor size and a three to ten mm you can get a maximum distance of fifteen roughly fifteen meters recognition so you just say i need a camera 3 to 10 mm sensor size so and so resolution so and so every 15 meters that's your recognition okay so if you do this for one project you will find out that it's all it's the same for every other project because uh, the coverage actually depends on 
these parameters focal length resolution and uh, sensor not really dependent on vendor models uh, very slight in fact but it's not really dependent on that that's why you can use a non mo uh, we don't have to choose any vendor you can still do the coverage because it's just formulas which tell you how much you can cover mathematical formula okay okay now so someone asked me to explain a bit about body percentage uh, body percentage is a very old uh, method okay let me okay body percentage is uh, before megapixel cameras came into mainstream people were using body percentage this particular person if i cover head to feet this is 100 percent if i cover head to feet i'm covering 100 percent of the human being right now i'm covering more than 100 percent but however this is 100 percent okay if i cover from head to just the knee or maybe just a little uh, below the torso that is i'm covering 120 percent okay i'm not covering the full person i am zooming in and i'm covering uh, from head to uh, just below the torso that is 120 percent so if i get look at a person uh, i zoom in then cover more than the person uh, full person that's 120 okay then just a second Detection. Okay, detection fifty percent. All right. So, uh, and then you have the recognition and detection. Typically, they say ten percent of the entire scene or uh, if the person height is 10 percent of the entire scene that is your detection and then uh, let's say uh, let me do the points. Okay, uh, let me think it's some delay here. Okay, so let's say, uh, let's say this is my screen. Okay, if by person, face of the person is here, let's say the face of the person body and and from his feet you are seeing little bit okay not the entire feet maybe the remaining feet is here so this is 120 percent you are seeing full from the screen from head to feet you're covering him this is 120 percent however if you in the screen if this person you're covering head to feet from top to bottom 100 percent uh, if you see in the screen, let's say this yellow box is also screen, if only 50%, all right, so this is your 50%, 10% will be very small. So 10% of your scene, that is 10%. So you just, this is basically detection. Uh, this is the old method of uh, prioritizing uh, design. Today we use pixel per meter 
this uh, body representation has nothing to do with pixel per meter it is not dependent on it it purely depends on the lens you can you can achieve body percentage even with uh, half megapixel you know back then we didn't have even megapixel camera but we were still following the standard you can even achieve this with half megapixel but you need a very big lens to achieve identification you need a, a very large lens uh, um, if you need 3 mm here you might need 10 to 12 mm with half megapixel to get 120% so uh, today we are or majority of the regions have migrated to this standard because you can cover more and you don't need a uh, basically you uh, if you use body percentage you are rejecting completely the idea of pixels right there is no point in investing a megapixel camera because anyway you are going to just zoom in with uh, the lens to get full 120 percent so it can be half mega it can be one mega doesn't matter so what's the point in investing in megapixel so there should be some benefit that's why pixel per meter is universally accepted in many regions some cities are still following the old but otherwise majority of the place we use pixel all right uh, let's go ahead uh, there are also 3d drawings available uh, this what we saw is all 2d two dimension uh, if you are using revit if you're using bim uh, bim uh, tools um, you can download files from any vendor they will have a specific uh, file called uh, uh, they will have a 3d image uh, revit file you can download and you can directly use it as well let me explain So here we go, BIM Revit. You can use this file and directly you'll get a 3D uh, coverage uh, in your Revit uh, application. So you can directly drop and use this to do coverage drawings. So we have a YouTube video on how to use this. Uh, I will not cover about it too much today uh, because this is a fundamental w uh, 3d 3d is something you can learn in addition to this so uh, there's a question what is en 6276 okay en 6276 so it's part of the doris standard detection identification uh, sorry <laughs> yeah Okay, let me pull that out. Uh, so the definition, when I said we need a certain level of uh, identification, like certain pixels, uh, this all comes from a standard. So you can, this standard is AN6276 or 50132. Okay, so you can refer this standard and uh, what you're seeing is a result of that standard. Here we go. Okay. Next is the resolution. Higher the resolution, higher the pixel per meter okay higher the resolution higher the pixels if you have a hd camera one megapixel camera roughly one million pixels if you have a two megapixel camera you have two million pixels you're covering the same scene but you're providing double the pixels more details more details also means more bandwidth more data right so 4k is like 
8 million pixels or 8 megapixel so you're again provide maybe you're using the 4k camera to cover the same training room or same entrance but you get more detail because you are providing more pixels so simply put higher the resolution higher the pixels higher the pixels higher the bandwidth higher the uh, storage higher the data all right the minimum pic uh, resolution used at cctv is one sif it used to be quite common 10 years back uh, 10 to 12 years back it was quite common for even uh, public surveillance so if you remember very old days uh, the cctv footage used to be so small and blurry uh, because yeah it was using one sif and four sif today it's quite nice we uh, have a commonly we are using two megapixel and uh, many sites have standardized even five mega and 4k all right how do you visualize one sif if you take a visiting card your business visiting card that's the uh, that's the size of the image if you print it on a paper that visiting card size that's the size of the image quality if you zoom in it's going to be looking very bad if you put it on a 42 inch screen that visiting card size image for sure it looks very blurry right so the quality will is not great uh, so we don't use that anymore but it was once the uh, you could say the normal standard before so that's where we started from So uh, I have a question. If we use 4K, can we identify a person? Uh, yeah, you can. Yes. So that is one of the benefit of using a 4K camera. You can cover a wide area and still get more pixels. For example, uh, let's say this particular camera. pixel per meter uh, let's my door this glass door is roughly one meter wide okay so if I measure the pixel in this door area I will know how many pixels are available per meter so right now this particular door I am achieving 250 pixels so if anyone walks in through the door I can guarantee I will get identification all right because the minimum for identification is 250 pixels now if uh, for example i am zoomed out okay and oh and by the way uh, one of you had asked what is uh, ian 6276 um, Yeah, so it's the uh, the pixel per meter is specified by the standard European standard EN6276 and there is an older version EN50132 okay so both refer to the same topic all right back to this image now I have zoomed out I have zoomed out okay now let's measure the pixel per meter if a person is walking through the door i am only achieving 110 pixels so there is no guarantee you can identify if a person is walking through the door that's why you need a uh, different zoom lens or to zoom in and get identification what if you cannot zoom 
in that case make sure you buy a a 4k camera let me check if i have a 4k around for this location that okay anyhow it's fine uh, so this is a 5 megapixel camera at this uh, distance let's say around 10 to 12 meters for one meter i'm only achieving 110 pixels so if i use a 4k in the same location i will get more horizontal pixel you have to only look at the first number h by v horizontal this is horizontal left to right is horizontal 110 pixel per meter i'm only getting 110 not enough to get identification even recognition not good because 125 is the minimum for recognition some people say 100 some of them say 125 but roughly speaking this is just a bare minimum even for recognition all right so if you are having no other option you need to cover the entire training room you need to still get identification for a person coming through the door then you have to change the camera with a higher resolution but if you are not really concerned about covering the entire training room and uh, you have option to zoom in sacrifice the viewing area a bit then you can get identification by double we can double check okay i need to zoom in further focus Two hundred and forty-three. All right, close to two fifty. So now I can get identification. I can zoom a little bit more as well. Now this is called bare minimum identification. Previously you saw strong identification. Uh, the reason for strong identification is uh, low light areas. You cannot guarantee the amount of same amount of light you cannot say in a hotel you will have this light you cannot say at night time parking areas will have these lights maybe there will be just one light or maybe the ambient lighting will be 10 times lower hardly 10 lux 20 lux right now in my office it's around 300 lux to 500 lux right below the this lighting i can get around 400 to 500 lux um, just to visualize you know in the night time if you go in the streets you can uh, you can download this in your mobile phone lux meter we will play lux meter you can just download this app to give you an idea so you can measure the amount of light it's available on your mobile phone on your android you can download this it just show it below the lighting it will measure the amount of light coming in that area as you go far from the light the light will reduce you keep it under the table the light will reduce uh, the lux level will reduce so you in hotel entrances the chances are uh, lighting is very dim okay so how do you still guarantee identification because identification is a must we cannot sacrifice what you don't know from which country the guest is coming and you need to get a clear detail who's in your property so there if you have low light locations and you need identification just jump the requirement to 500 pixels double the minimum requirement so for sure you're not going to miss if anybody's walking through the door that's as good like 120 percent you know you can compare to that level so let me zoom this camera Oh, it's already the max okay okay one two seven six zero all right so here let's say if you want strong identification so you are able to see the person very clearly right so why is that if you measure it's almost 200 and also the lighting is good now if i want okay. 
Okay, oops. Now if I measure, this is, okay, it's 1,000. So this is still 800. So if someone is walking through the door, for sure I can get his face very clearly. So this is 800 pixel per meter. So uh, this particular camera is a bigger lens camera. That's why I said certain entrances you need long lens. So there are cameras with large lens like this. All right, now let's uh, take a break and then we'll come back for the next topic.
All right, let's resume. Next is uh, compression. Here we are focusing on IP camera. All right. When you are working with IP cameras or any generally camera CCTV and especially high resolution, uh, storage is a big concern. The more resolution you move towards the more the quality of the image that is needed higher the storage required but some of you might have realized previously let's say again I compare with roughly a 10 year period 10 years back we were covering the same area we were requiring the same storage even today after migrating to 2 megapixel you still require similar storage two terabyte was used for half megapixel 10 years back for one camera today also you require roughly two terabyte for one day recording for two megapixel camera how is that possible it's purely because of codec all right so what is this codec codec means coding and decoding ip camera the coding happens at the bottom the coding happens in the camera and it is done it's dumped onto the storage in analog camera the dvr the recorder does the coding all right coding is a image stream packaged digitally and sent over the network right and once you view it uh, on the screen that is a decoding okay now what are the different codecs available since 1992 codec uh, started out with jpeg jpeg was an image then we had motion jpeg then we had mpeg4 then h.264 which is already 15 years old then we had h.265 these are the different codecs what is the benefit of codec why do you need a codec in CCTV without codec it is almost impossible to do any project you cannot supply even one camera for a project uh, so codec is as important as that if you take uh, this is like a thumb rule calculation if you take a five minute video of 2 MP you require around 55 GB storage without codec without any kind of uh, compression or uh, if you want to record a video for five minutes you require 55 gb it's like this uh, how to visualize how to understand imagine watching a video online let's say youtube video for five minutes and your data package is done it's complete finished or used up okay so that's the impact of codec so YouTube has their own uh, special algorithm codec algorithm however uh, five minute okay 55 GB your data may be some of you have 10 some of you may have unlimited but so you understand right for a 2 megapixel itself just for five minutes you are using 55 GB without codec so um, how does a camera work when a camera sends 30 frames every picture is called a frame or you can say image 30 images per second so image one image two all right in image one and two the only difference is this particular object has moved slightly forward to a new location every other detail remains the same there is no changes so what the codec does codec is like an algorithm it looks at the scene and it decides all right most of the image is same so i will not send the redundant redundant data so all the redundant data will be reused okay 
and when it is reused uh, it will send only the difference this guy this is the difference compared to the previous image so let's say uh, when you play back your camera or your system when it decodes it will automatically merge with the reference frame the previous one is the reference frame the difference is called the partial frame there are other words for the reference frame called the iframe full frame uh, cannot hear me just a second I hope I'm audible. Okay. Okay, great, great. Okay, thank you. I'll continue. Right, so we were talking about uh, codec. What is the power of codec? The, the main purpose of codec is uh, to let go of redundant data. Now, you saw the car here moving from location one to be now you might think uh, this may not be the case everywhere actually it's the case everywhere because when you are taking a video the camera sends 30 frames per second you might just read it as frames per second it's actually 30 pictures per second let's you are all sitting at your desk some of you may be on the phone some of you are driving whatever but within one second, did you move a lot? Did your environment change? Did your tables move? Did the walls move? Did the road move? No, right? So within a second, 30 pictures is a lot of information. And for sure, there is bound to be a lot of redundant data, right? So codec is, you can say it is like the bloodline for streaming. Okay. Uh, so once you apply a codec, uh, only the partial images will be sent. It's called the P-frame. It merges with the I-frame when you decode. And the I-frame is also called as uh, full frame, key frame. The small one is called partial frame or P-frame. H.265 is uh, s slightly more beneficial because it tries to take... Uh, so right now you see the image is chopped into small blocks. And then it will process within that block. It will just check uh, the redundancy. In H.265, it will take bigger blocks because you have uh, H.265 is good for higher resolution, like 4K, 5 megapixel. Uh, more pixels are there, right? So it will take bigger blocks and will try to reduce. Perhaps here it will combine the four as one single block with a few differences. So it will reduce even further. It require more processing. H.265 is more processor intensive because of this, because it tries to find more redundant data and reduce the image even further. Now, after this merge, did you lose any data? Not really. It's called the compression. Make sure you don't lose the usable data, right? That's the objective of this codec. So uh, H.265 is not going to reduce the quality. H.265, although higher compression standard, it is a new method. It actually can improve the image quality in some aspects okay and uh, h.265 will be very effective for higher resolution it can go all the way up to 50 percent reduction 
But if you take a half megapixel and you compare H.264, H.265, there is nothing to reduce. It's already a half, half megapixel. So there you cannot expect 50% reduction. So uh, you will see H.264, which is uh, almost 15 years old, uh, perform uh, or take a very high bandwidth when you go above 2 megapixel. Today, the moment you go 3, 4, 5 mega, 4K, H.264 takes a very high storage. That's why H.265 comes in the picture. Okay, there are other uh, standards. They are not actually a standard. It's called a vendor-specific technology. H.265 plus, some people call Ystream, some smart compression, Zipstream. These are all different technology words used by vendor to reduce the bandwidth even further even further above h26 that's why it's called h265 plus additional on top of that you add okay you don't create a new codec you add on top of that some more techniques to reduce the bandwidth all right what is the technique uh, one of them is uh, uh, wherever the scene is uh, idle you inject less bandwidth okay then another technique iframe right every 30 frames you need one reference frame let's say if you're uh, where is that you have one reference frame and you have multiple p frames what if uh, you send one reference frame after every 10 seconds because maybe offices are closed cameras simply looking at the lift uh, schools are closed. So what's the point in sending even iframe every second? Just start uh, making more. Don't send every second. Send, uh, for example, let's say 25 frames per second. iframe is one and then remaining P frame, let's say 24. So because offices are closed, the camera can decide, all right, there is no activity at all. Now I will send, uh, I will stop sending iframe uh, for more longer duration. So let's say after 10 seconds, 10 real seconds, it will send one iframe and remaining P frame will be 24, 240 minus one, 239 will be P frames. So one iframe and 239 preframe. So you're reducing the interval. So these are techniques to reduce your storage. Okay. I hope to show you a short demonstration. This can take some time. Let's just, uh, let me pull it out. X and V. This guy. Let me make it all high resolution. 5 mega H265 and uh, Y stream. So this additional compression, we call it Y stream. And uh, every vendor have additional uh, proprietary techniques to make it really efficient. You know? Uh, because let's say, uh, okay, I, when I demonstrate, I'll explain it to you. So let's go back to video profiles. H.264. Okay. Right now, this camera is five megapixel. I think uh, that is 208. Just a second, please. Ok, 
okay i think all right uh all right i will just demonstrate as it is all right let's say right now it's around 2.7 okay the average will be here around uh, 1.9 whereas the same thing with h265 is 1.3 mbps 1.8 mbps 1.3 mbps for a 5 megapixel all right uh, now if i activate y stream let's make it high after 10 seconds we will get the new average what y stream does or why what this extra compression techniques h265 plus and uh, y stream zip stream smart compression what they do is they observe the scene if there is no activity they will reduce the size of the uh, iframe even further they will not inject bandwidth if as i mean if it is not required however if there is a moment so right now it reduced uh, h265 became 1.2 sorry 0.9 h264 became 1.2 Uh, the new average is 0.7 and 0.8. Okay, I divide by 1000 because Mbps, right now Kbps. So you can say it's less than one Mbps for a five megapixel camera, right? This is what the technology does. If there is no activity, it will not do any movement. Okay, however, if there is any movement, automatically it will go up just like you, you are waiting at the red light and when there is a red light changes to green, then you start, right? Same way the camera will also inject more fuel, more bandwidth as required and then immediately reduce if not required. All right, so voice stream and these kind of smart compression techniques are very, very powerful. They can reduce the storage a lot without affecting the image quality. And by the way, we only did the Y stream basic technique. Then uh, there is also the dynamic GOV. So let's uh, check that. This is the this is also part of Y stream. So it, I can explain that. disconnect and connect so this is a even more aggressive method right now the bandwidth became 40 that's like 0 0.004 mbps right yeah 40 divided by 1000 so then 0 0.04 and uh, here you have or in kbps 284 7 10 so if the bandwidth automatically reduces if there is no activity in the scene so you can see how drastically it can reduce okay here you can tell the camera to even reduce frame rate if there is no activity so these are these extra features some vendors add to their camera to reduce the bandwidth because there's no point recording uh, data which is having no value right there's no moment if there is a moment automatically the frame rate will go back to 2025 all right let's move to the next topic Which is better? H265 is definitely better. Right, right. Uh, there is a point where you are asking me to repeat it. Uh, which part? Is it the Y stream part or is it the difference between H264 and H265? and uh, i think i will also do the repeat uh, exactly after we finish the session so for the benefit of others as we go to the next topic it's completely different i will come back to that just hope you hope that's okay yeah all right
why stream okay why stream i will cover that exactly as soon as we finish i will come back to that okay all right all right next uh, topic is uh, camera shapes uh, inside the camera the processor may be almost similar some cameras may have more features some will have less features uh, but the shape of the camera will alter with change depending on the application it's like wearing a dress for different occasion same way you have to have a camera for an outdoor different you have to have a camera with a longer lens a different shape because you need bigger bow bigger body to fix the lens then you have a uh, pinhole cameras these are inside the atm machines hidden cameras then stainless steel body camera micro dome camera transportation mounted camera uh, bullet cameras for outdoor dome camera for indoor first one is dome the last one is also dome but it is metallic so it can be used outdoor uh, this is indoor usually for left very small retail shops you will find small micro cameras which corner mount cameras uh, this is not the full list by the way there are different shapes of cameras depending on the application all right then there are also uh, very bold shapes like multi-directional cameras 180 degree panoramic view so let's have a look at a video to explain that better panoramic What is the purpose of a panoramic camera? The panoramic camera is a wide angle, 180 degree view camera. I wonder why it's taking some time. Okay. one two three four lenses stitched together as one single camera this is a panoramic camera the goal is to get a one clear view all the way from one end to the other end of the scene without any break without any gaps in between this is from our previous office in the us then we have multi-directional camera Okay, this is also multi-sensor. That means four cameras in one. Then there is something called multi-directional camera. In multi-direction, four cameras looking in four different directions. Basically, it combines four cameras in one body, single cable, single license, if you're using with a VMS, just one cable but four separate lens, four separate lens, looking at four different directions. You can zoom separately, you can do analytics and other features, everything separately, independently, but it will have one cable, one body. And for the installation cost, it's like installing one camera, right? Physically, you need one bracket to install the camera on top of the, street so you especially city surveillance where cable pulling and all is expensive uh, and, uh, these kind of in cameras do great justice 
one, two, three, four. You can keep it at the bottom or you can keep it on the side. These are multi-direction. Each camera will look at four different directions. This is not a stitched image. This is just a four direction camera. Then there is also two direction cameras. Camera which look at uh, especially longer corridors or perpendicular corridors. Uh, when you walk in and then you take perpendicular right. So you need a camera at the corner looking in two different directions. So you can customize the lens, you can choose the lens resolution and so on. All right, this is a perpendicular location. So this is the objective of this camera. This is from uh, the roof of the, our office. So one looking at the seating area, the other looking at the walking area. Okay, next comes multi-direction with a pan tilt to zoom pan tilt to zoom what is the objective of this camera is to look at all four direction if any incident there's a moment automatically the camera the bottom camera will zoom in okay so you have four view and one ptc view you can click here ptc camera will go there right it's like it's like you have eyes all around and you can even zoom in like a binocular you can zoom in and check what happened then comes fisheye, all right, fisheye. The objective of fisheye is to cover the entire, entire uh, room. This is a small grocery shop or a small shop, uh, uh, you can say small, it's not a supermarket, it's a grocery shop. Uh, you, one camera can cover the entire scene, all right. So, this is called a situational awareness camera. In case of any incident, you know where the person came from. Maybe he came from this door, right? Or he came from behind. Maybe there is some guy who walked in from here. You can get a full view without any blind spot, without any hidden area. But the challenge is you can't really see the face. You still need a face, a camera at the entrance. But in order to get full view, these cameras are useful. Store rooms, um, training halls, warehouses, you can use these cameras, data centers, to get a full view. When, wherever you have these aisles, and if you want to go for the most cost-effective option, fisheye is a very good solution to have a monitoring of what's going on. And you can have one camera at the entrance. Okay, and uh, fisheye will not always look like this. You can, there is some feature called de-warp. What is de-warp? You can uh, digitally change the way it looks. You can digitally zoom in and find out. So this is the same camera, but it is digitally broken into four separate images. Okay, that can be done. To some extent, you can do that. Okay, so it is a part of this image. You can have different types of mode. You can move left and right and check and so on. Okay, so this is eight zones. Each zone you can block a separate location. Okay, so we'll see that later on. Panoramic, multi-direction, multi-direction with a pan tilt zoom. And we saw about two direction. Next is vendor product categorization. Um, when you approach any vendor, uh, the common mistake today is f there are different series for any vendor. They have high end, they have a mid range, they have low end, they might have another intermediate range. But what's the common mistake today? People think if they get a high resolution, that means I have purchased the highest model from this particular brand actually no you might get uh, even in the low end category a vendor might have a 4k camera 4k resolution even in high end he may have a 4k camera so resolution is no longer a differentiating factor for vendors okay uh, if you are still being led in that direction 
that's just the way to uh, manipulate to get you to think that all right you have purchased the most expensive that's not the case at the best price or something so uh, the features behind the camera is what makes the camera uh, what what costs the camera the features what analytic what analytics it can do what can the camera do by itself can the camera think by itself it can decide by itself if someone is walking in can it create an alarm if someone is going out if they walk in it's okay if they go out at a certain time can it decide can it differentiate between a person and a car so these are the intelligence in the camera that makes the difference and that's where the processor changes second thing is um, hardware hardware in the sense if you require uh, a longer lens if you require a low light or if you require higher ir range these are not common right higher than the standard is not a common so those all models will fall under your uh, slightly special category all right they can have slightly different pricing uh, some okay previously wdr was also major difference now it's almost diminish diminishing almost every camera is wdr uh, previously some cameras were not wdr so wdr you know it takes two pictures it works twice as fast so it had a different processor and all that so they were more expensive but now it's diminishing okay and of course you saw multi-direction they are not a standard camera they are like four camera and one body they will be also on a different it's a differentiating factor okay so uh, i will take our product lineup as an example we categorize into q x p and t series what is our motto behind it the standard requirement falls under q standard lens standard ir range 30 meter ir range standard shape dome bullet shapes falls under q series standard analytics someone is crossing the line someone is walking in a specific zone intrusion uh, basic counting analytics so whatever is commonly required motion tampering will fall under q okay then above the standard i need 50 mm lens you remember one of the camera is zoomed in all the way to the door so a special lens long lens i need 70 meter ir i need stainless steel shape or i need 15 20 analytics in the camera so those are slightly above the standard they fall under our x series uh, artificial intelligence Le you can, we have two levels of that the x series and then we also have in p series customized artificial intelligence for city surveillance maybe some customer says okay i want to do uh, a vehicle stop to vehicle detection or some um, you can it could be a uh, trash detection so customized intelligence customize the camera uh, covid solution mask detection extra features if they want uh, multi-directional cameras so they all fall under your p series so this is how we are differentiating then there are cameras which are used once in a while every five years there is a project for a prison so they might buy or a border security you might find thermal camera oil rig camera corner mount camera all under a special vertical series okay we have two megapixel in q we have two megapixel in x we have 4k in q we have 4k in x we have five megapixel in q we have five megapixel in x even in p series we have mostly 4k so the differentiating factor is not typically resolution it is your features what you can get out of the camera all right then the uh, last topic for today is about shutter speed Okay, let me just review if Okay, there are some good questions. I will be answering that immediately after this. Uh, will it be that bandwidth okay so one question i can immediately answer is 
a four camera quad camera it will take four times the bandwidth yes it will take four times it's like four camera but physically it uses one cable all the data will be sent basically four times through that single cable yeah that is true then i don't make any changes in so uh, I have a question here in Y stream. Does it make any change in frame rate? Y stream, there are two options. If you want, you can change the frame rate also, or without the frame rate, it, without affecting the frame rate, you can continue to still get reduction in the bandwidth. So uh, this is this is what it is. You can see here. There is an option called dynamic frame rate dynamic you can tell the camera if there is no activity change the frame rate you can say don't go below 12 frames so you can push that kind of settings into camera so these settings you may not find in every brand this is where this extra slight you know customizations are made uh, compared to you know one brand compared to the other one Okay. All right, then there are more questions which I'll be answering in, as soon as we complete uh, in another 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, shutter speed. Shutter speed, uh, this is, uh, you know, the reason for covering this is not to make you an expert in configuring the camera on the field. Most of you may not be doing it, but the idea is to get an understanding that just because you increase full shutter speed just because you increase full noise reduction does not mean the image will become magically beautiful right it's a very uh, sensitive um, they call it the triangle there are settings uh, shutter speed gain noise gain uh, noise reduction aperture control amount of light to gather all this is like a triangle you affect one side other two gets affected one side of the triangle will reduce the size of the other side or increase the size so you have to find the fine balance between them you cannot increase everything to the maximum and expect the image to become very good um, one good point here is uh, artificial intelligence we have in cameras today they can decide by themselves depending on the scene what kind of settings are required for that what shutter speed is required but it's still new right it just released these kind of technology just released but until today people are still using this traditional method is you will have a person trying to configure each and every setting to get the best picture okay so what's the concept of this shutter speed simple shutter speed uh, if you okay here's a description how much of time the light is given to enter the camera right the camera it opens its eye allows the light to enter it captures the picture just like us but how much of time you give right how much of time you give for the light to enter um, that is referred to as your shutter speed if you close and open the eyes fast okay you allow very less light to enter okay when you close and open your eyes faster it becomes the image will become dark however if you do the other way you slowly open wait for some time then close more light is allowed to enter okay it also depends on how wide you open and how much time you leave it open so there is another parameter but right now let's just focus on this time part okay faster slower faster you open and close image is darker i will show you a video about it then comes motion blur okay if you allow more time for the light to enter that means you still haven't taken the picture the person is walking through the bus you kept the eye open I mean the camera shutter open only when it closes it captures that picture right so in the same before it closed the person ran all the way towards the bus so that means when the same picture the person is at the door of the bus as well as near the camera 
so the person is at two different locations before the camera closed its eye to take a picture so this um, this is a side effect of slower shutter speed although the image is brighter the image becomes more blurry all right now uh, let's uh, to, to explain that let's go ahead and check here okay right now this is a video probably looks good probably looks fine okay the shutter speed is around one by five that means in one second it is closing five times one by five okay what's the challenge when i pause the image and take a closer look at the number plate it's very blurry okay let me open one video this is a common video which i referred from youtube uh, explaining about shutter speed all right so let's say this is a roller coaster moving fast okay shutter speed 1 by 50 within one second you're taking around 50 times you're closing your shutter and taking the picture okay not good enough you see it's still blurry so for fast moving objects you have to close even faster so let's say the person now shifts to 1 by 400 in 1 by 400 the image is much more clear okay again 1 by 50 you see how blurry it is then go back to 1 by 400 you are able to see faster moving object more clearer okay 1 by 50 1 by 520 1 by 50 if I pause the face is all smudged you cannot see the details clearly Oops. all right so um, let's close the video So for fast moving objects, shutter speed higher is good. Then comes uh, gain control. Gain control is important. The reason is um, in you cannot put very high opening or you cannot put two second shutter speed. You need a faster shutter speed, one by hundredth of a second, one by two hundred of a second to capture fast moving objects. Why I said entrance is fast moving object? Because the person will walk fast in the entrance, right? He's not gonna take one step at a time and then wait for one second or two seconds. Here, if you put two seconds, that means you're saying the person should take every step every two seconds. That is not possible. So that's why that is not good enough. Uh, if you want to capture moving objects, you need to have one by 200th of a second. So higher the shutter speed is good, but there is also a downside. Now you should have to make sure only shutter speeds are high in uh, main entrance and those kind of car parking entrance areas. And what, how much you can say is up to one by 10,000 or 2,000, this is good enough, one by 2,000 of a second, okay? Now, uh, shutter speed and frame rate has nothing to do, there's no difference. Uh, the frame rate will still be 25 frames, okay? So that is something else. Okay. Now, all right, uh, now I'm going to talk about gain. Now, uh, in your project, your car is moving fast, right? So you need to capture and increase the shutter speed. Now what to do, the image is very dark. There's no way to increase the lighting, All right? So in that case, there is another setting that is known as gain control. 
gain control is similar to uh, a very easy way to understand is if you don't hear anything you increase the volume right that is called gain you are increasing the gain or amplifying the signal or if someone is talking on a microphone if you cannot hear him you increase the volume okay so that is good same way every camera gain is used but the challenge is even if let's say if someone is talking behind me even his voice will be amplified let's say a no some noise is there there's a background noise someone is talking behind my back or there's a fan moving there's some other equipment working so ac sound whatever whatever noise unwanted sound that also gets amplified so if you notice gain level low and high low the image is dark what you saw here the image is dark but if you increase the gain the image will become brighter but the noise also starts to increase okay let's go back how important is gain right now if you it's called agc automatic gain control agc is off now if you increase the gain it will make it as good as day right gain control so if i make it off that means the camera is not increasing the amplification i make it high so basically it is amplifying whatever light is available and trying to see the image so now i am somehow able to see the person's face when he enters the door okay so gain is available in every brand every camera now gain is introducing another issue that is known as noise um so that's why noise reduction technology came okay so it's like you need everything and then you need something else to fix that so noise reduction means uh on the left side you can see this dot 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 that is actually noise unwanted information um or pick uh, pixel with no relevant information right so noise reduction there are two types 2d and 3d noise uh, we have both most vendors have uh, also similar 2d 3d noise what it does is it tries to compare the image uh, and before and after and uh, remove this unwanted uh, noise 2d noise i will just explain what is the difference 2d noise means within the same frame it will try to compare do some calculations and reduce the noise 2d noise is good 3d noise is better 3d noise it will compare multiple frames to reduce the noise so when you apply 3d noise the image is more crisp more clear okay so if you see on the top uh, there's a tree with dotted line, dotted noise 2d noise will remove some what but 3d will remove entirely okay <laughs> now now the uh, funny thing is 3d noise has its own issue because it is comparing multiple frames to reduce noise if the object is again moving faster then you will also have again blurring effect because it's comparing multiple frames it's called dragging effect is something you can see here it's called ghosting you see the person you basically see him just little little bit because so let let it come back so, so this is called ghosting because the camera is trying and struggling so hard now he has added light so now it's more clear because there is no light the camera is struggling to gather light putting all the amplification doing noise reduction it leads to ghosting and uh, so this is ghosting that's why in night time when you see there are two people next to each other so it's like when a person moves there is two person that is ghosting effect so in order to overcome that you need to have noise reduction uh, noise reduction is important 2d and 3d both are important and uh, some cameras are intelligent um, most of our actually for us all our cameras have 2d and 3d noise and we mix both how do we mix both when an object is moving only in those areas we apply 2d noise and the static areas we apply 3d noise so you will see it in my in my camera interface there are two levels 2d noise reduction that means the camera will only focus on the moving objects and uh, do 2d noise reduction 3d noise reduction it will apply on the static objects there are different levels to it okay 
So gain is used, and to compensate the issue with gain, you also use noise reduction. Okay, and to avoid ghosting effect, you have to minimize your 3D noise reduction. Anyway, now here the takeaway is, is your camera supporting noise reduction? If it supports, it is good. Can it support 2D and 3D? Good. If it supports both at the same time, better. All right, now we'll talk about the fine balance. This is my environment, okay? Now the reason for showing this example is, um, there is a very common misunderstanding. The customer says, okay, increase exposure, increase the, uh, you know, not even customers, even our own, uh, our own partners, they think that, okay, let's increase everything to the maximum. If you increase shutter speed to the maximum, your image becomes dark. If you increase noise reduction to the maximum, you will have ghosting. If you increase exposure to the maximum, uh, you, either the image will become too dark or too bright. So if you increase f-stop, it will become too dark or too bright. So everything is related, right? So you have to find the fine balance. That's where the experts come in, uh, trained SIs come in, um, and yourself also to have an understanding you know, how things work. You will not find an issue in, ev in everything, only in the main entrance, only in the car park entrance where you're looking, where you're looking for the phase and the number plate, you will need this kind of fine adjustment. Okay, this is my image, uh, looks good, 300 lux, good lighting, but if I increase, reduce the light level to five lux, five lux is uh, like your emergency lighting is 10 lux. If you switch off all the lights, there is only one light, that is 10 lux, half of that, all right. Even with this lighting, the camera is trying to give a color picture. Looks okay. At first glance, everything seems fine. <clears throat> Sorry for that. This is the camera shutter speed. The camera is adjusting automatically. It will take a range, choose whatever shutter speed is important for that scene. It will apply noise reduction. Uh, it will apply high gain. Now, it's fine. Overall, it image looks good. But when you zoom in and on, try to look at the number plate, you see the number plate is blurred out. Okay, overall monitoring, you're happy, but when you do investigation, forensic search, you're not happy. So what to do? So this is where adjustment comes in. First thing uh, we have to do is we change the shutter speed, All right? You see before the image was bright, now I'm increasing the shutter speed, images become dark. But some, some visibility is there on the number plate. Okay, still not good enough. So what I'm going to do, there is ghost, it's fine. Overall, it image looks good. But when you zoom in and on, try to look at the number plate, you see the number plate is blurred out. Okay, overall monitoring, you're happy. But when you do investigation, forensic search, you're not happy. So what to do? So this is where adjustment comes in. First thing uh, we have to do is we change the shutter speed. All right, you see before the image was bright, now I'm increasing the shutter speed, images become dark. But some some visibility is there on the number plate. Okay, still not good enough. So what I'm going to do, there is ghosting, right? You can see the train multiple times. That is called ghosting. So I'm going to reduce the noise reduction. And because of noise reduction, there is ghosting. So now I switched off noise reduction. Now I can see the number plate. So I'm happy because I can see the number plate, but when I look at the image on the left side, I'm not happy because it looks very, very horrible. You see the lot of dots everywhere. It's very, very, very messed up. So you need both, right? So in that case, what we do is we need noise reduction. We have to do noise reduction. Now, the who, what is the root cause of this noise? Gain, because the camera is doing too much gain, the noise is also amplified. So he's going to reduce the amplification, automatic gain control, he's now reduced it. Now the noise is gone almost, but the image is still super dark. So now we have to increase step by step, make the gain a little bit middle and the noise reduction slightly higher, shutter speed slightly lower, and try to find the find balance so you can get the number plate clearly. Okay, so these are the most important factors for uh, capturing a good image. Uh, 
uh, camera should have flexibility in shutter speed. It should have noise reduction control. It should have good automatic gain control. Okay, so I have a question. What is uh, shutter speed one by 20? Okay, so question is, which is faster? Let's see. Let me open an Excel sheet. Okay, no uh, calculator. Okay, if my shutter speed is one, that means every one second, the iris will close, take the picture and open and take another picture in every second. Okay. If it is one by 20th, that means one second divided by one by 20, 120. So the camera, the iris will move as fast as 0 0.008 seconds. So it is that fast. Uh, it's microsecond, nanosecond, that concept, I cannot really relate at the moment with the micro or nano, but it is 0 0.008 of a second. So we have cameras going up to one by 12,000 of shutter. So one divided by 12,000. So that is, yeah, 10 to the power five. So that fast it can capture. Now, no object moves that fast. Uh, one by 2,000, 5,000 is good. Up to 10,000 is this, you can say it's a good camera, safe camera. And the uh, shutter speed, the minimum should be one by uh, one second or uh, one by 30th. Generally speaking, if you notice, no one will use two second as a shutter speed because two second means you're saying the object should move every step, every two seconds. So that's like super slow. Uh, we never use it in CCTV. We only use it for photography and all those areas where you want only still picture, only one picture where you don't care about blur, but it just takes one picture. However, in CCTV, you have to capture multiple frames. So generally people use one by 30. For if you take any camera out of the box, they are specced at one by 30. One by 30 is not good for fast moving objects, but it is good for general purpose monitoring. Okay. So one by 30 means one divided by 30th of a second. So divide in 30 parts, so 0 0.03 seconds. So at this speed, that means, uh, okay, another uh, point, higher the number, higher the shutter speed. Okay, now you don't have to worry. The good part is cameras come with predefined shutter uh, settings. You don't have to worry what is the exposure. You don't have to worry what is the closing and shutter speed and all that stuff. All our cameras come with, uh, with predefined presets. You can just tell the camera, this camera is not straightforward area. It is going to be in number plate area or in, it's going to be a lot of backlight or there's going to be a lot of bright air scenes, a lot of glass or something like that. So if you just select this, automatically the camera will adjust every setting according to the sign. So we have done this preset based on our multiple feedbacks from different customers. Uh, different settings that they use. So we have number plate preset, we have vivid video. Most of the demo cameras will be in vivid video mode. Uh, then number plate is for number plate area, indoor backlight, WDR. So you don't have to worry. All you do is just select and change the presets okay, to make it easier. So the idea is to make things process efficient to cover, uh, to commission faster. Right, so we've covered a good amount of information today. So the last topic for today is the networking where we will be discussing about IP address and uh, we'll touch on the first part of IP tools today. We will explain how do you create an IP address for a device and what is the meaning of subnet mask and uh, gateway and all those things. So if you are aware of it, you will be able to communicate better to a networking person or even to a CCTV engineer in your project or you may be needed to configure a camera by yourself and you will have a better idea. Okay, now there are four parameters uh, involved when you create an IP address or for a device. That is uh, the IP address itself, then there are other values that need to be entered, subnet mask, gateway and DNS service. They're all related and uh, first we will see what is IP address and and its definition. Okay, IP address. IP address is every device needs to have a unique IP address. If you have a camera, 
it has its IP address will be different from my camera or another camera in that for project each project will have a unique IP address then we do enter subnet mask gateway and DNS again these will be explained in the coming slides okay now in order to understand uh, what is the an IP address made of it has an network ID and a host ID network ID means it's uh, okay let's take an example here John Smith Lisa Smith they have a child Emma Smith they belong to the same family Smith from their last name right so that is a network ID it's the uh, a camera belongs to which network it can be a CCTV network of a project network one of that particular project there can be an office network so each network will have an ID that's the network ID so here if the Smith is 192.168.0 that's the network ID then the host ID is the individual person's unique number one two three if you combine them you get your IP address network ID plus host ID is your IP address so if for example my IP address is 192.168.1.50 that means I belong to the network 192.168.1 and my IP address is 50. Now, how do you know where the, uh, uh, okay, we will see about the network ID. Uh, before that, how do you know it's a different device, it's a different network. So since you know the network ID is the first three group of numbers, and when you see another device, it has uh, 192.168, so far same, but the third number, is different that means it belongs to a this guy belongs to a different family or a different network or devices okay so it's outside your network so your family name network id first name is your host id okay <clears throat> now subnet mask it uh, if you put a subnet mask of 255 255 255.0 that means the first three digits belong to the network ID. The last zero is your host ID. Okay. A subnet mask divides the network ID from host ID. So let's say I am a particular packet is sending an do sending a data to device number two. Currently, it will figure out what is its network. Its network is 192.168.10. Uh, that is the network ID. So the subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. So it will do an AND calculation and figure out my network ID is 192.168.10.0. Next, the destination IP address is 192.168.10.22, this guy and its subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 so it will its network ID is 10.0 so basically how do you know a particular device's network ID you do an AND calculation of its IP address and the subnet mask and you will get the network ID very simple right so uh, 255 is actually 1111 when you do AND it is it's like 0 plus 1 is 0 okay uh, the last digit is 0 anyhow whatever you do the last will be 0 so you get the network ID at the end okay so from here they will figure out whether they both belong to the same network or it's a different network okay what is gateway now because they are in the same network in the same network switch they will be able to communicate next what is a gateway let's say you are communicating outside the network in that case you have to enter and exit through a specific port specific uh, location every building has a specific entrance or an exit door so that is called the gateway so here this is my let's say john smith and other smith and other guys in the network or all the cameras in the network if it has to speak outside there is an entrance that is the gateway so this is the gateway device. Your router is your gateway device. That's why all of us have the same gateway IP address in our 
computer you can check your colleagues each and every one of you have the same gateway because we all speak to the internet through one of the router in the office whenever we speak to outside network we can use a vpn what vpn does is it allows you to mask your identity for example let's say i am speaking to i am uh, in my office my laptop is connected or let's say um okay let's take it a uh, remote work from home let's say you are at home and your uh, computer systems are in the office all right in this case what you would do is at your home you will have a software called vpn client on in your office you will have a server called vpn server so the vpn server will take the traffic from the office encrypt it and then send it through the internet and then it will be received by your vpn client the client will decrypt and send the data back okay so that means nobody can uh, even if they steal the packets they cannot understand what it is in the packet because it is encrypted second thing is uh, when you are using a vpn client the client vpn client will change your ip address it will make it look like you are here so the device actually sends to the server within the server it thinks you are actually in the office because it changes your ip address to a local ip address as if you are in the office and the do i mean and then you are communicating in the office network as if you are sitting in the office and then the server is actually routing the traffic um to you over the internet as and uh, yeah so that's about that's how the vpn systems work okay within an ip address there are different classes we don't have to go too much into detail but one key point there is something called as uh, yeah class c class c ip address class a ip address class b ip address most of the local devices in your offices you may be using to fi uh, class c like if you have a small network you can use class c or if you have a large network you can use class b okay so you can see here uh, the ip address range starting range and the ending range is already predefined looking at the number you know it's a class c network and uh, looking at the starting number you know it's a class b network looking at the starting number you know it's a class a network all right okay an ip address can be static or manual uh, sorry automatic static static means uh, when i'm fixing an ip address 192.168.1.50 it will not change okay uh, dhcp means dynamic all right let's say okay let's say when you go to a mall shopping mall you are entering the shopping mall and you're connecting to its wi-fi network and then at that time your device needs to have an address when you connect to that wi-fi network right okay so when you go to the mall and you connect yourself the router there will assign or will just uh, the network will assign a ip address for you and then it's a temporary ip address okay and you don't have to manually enter it whenever you're connecting to a wi-fi you are never entering an ip address manually it is automatically assigned to you from the switch okay so that is called automatic uh, ip addressing so as soon as you connect the ip settings are pushed to your device and it will accept and save second thing when you leave the mall you are no longer using that ip address so it will release it from you your device and it will give it to someone else so that is called dynamic addressing okay how do you find an ip address there are two ways one is you can open the command prompt then when you type in ip config it will give your ip address so i can type uh, in my command prompt cmd 
click ping uh, ip config it will give my ip address all right if i want more details such as mac addresses you will be able to get that using another command ip config slash all it will provide the physical address of that particular device okay regarding mac address we will be covering that in the next day and that time you will be understanding it much better ping what is ping whenever you have a camera on the network how do you make sure <coughs> your camera can communicate with the operator pc with the recorder uh, let's say camera is on the fifth floor and your uh, computer is on the ground floor how do you make sure the communication path is perfectly fine in that case you would use couple uh, command called ping command for example let's say I am going to ping 192.168.1.160 camera device at this time it tells me first connection is good I'm able to communicate all right address is available uh, someone is already using that IP address so that means I cannot use it for another device all right then what is the round time is in uh, milliseconds roughly six milliseconds by the time it goes the packet is sent and it is coming back it takes roughly six milliseconds this is good anything less than 150 milliseconds is good communication is perfect all right so that brings us to the end of today's class um, if you have any questions you can post in the q a session and uh, feel free to disconnect the session is completed thank you so much for your time